Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 29 in MedSurge 1. This is Caring for Clients Undergoing Cardiovascular Surgery. We're going to first start with percutaneous coronary interventions, also known as PCI. So when we talk about PCI, this is a non-surgical procedure and it's performed to open the coronary arteries. And we do this through either an arthroectomy, um, stent, a percutaneous translumal coronary angioplasty or just plain angioplasty. Here there is a link to a stent placement video that you can watch um, at your own pace. So how do we decide if a PCI is indicated? Well, first, that's usually the occlusion of one or two coronary arteries that are easily accessible. Two, to reduce ischemia during the MI, and that's done within the first few hours of onset. So when that client comes in with that STEMI in progress, this is why they go to the cath lab immediately. It's an alternative to a cabbage, which is an open heart surgery. And it's used in conjunction with stent placement to prevent the artery from reocluding, and it dilates the coronary artery as well. Now you need to be familiar with complications from a PCI. And this is when we say a cardiac catheterization, this is what it is. A PCI is another um, term for that. So you can have complications such as artery dissection, cardiac tamponade, hematoma formation at the insertion site, allergic reaction to the contrast dye. You can have external bleeding at the insertion site. You can develop an embolism. You can have retroperitoneal bleeding, re-stenosis of the treated vessel, and you can also have acute kidney injury. Common medications used post-PCI are aspirin, Plavix, heparin, and Lovenox. So let's take a look at uh, coronary bypass procedures. So here's a diagram that kind of depicts how um, the blood is um, averted or I should say rerouted during the procedure. So if you look at number one, it starts with the oxygen poor blood leaves the heart um, to enter the heart lung machine. And then the heart-lung machine pumps and adds oxygen to the blood before it returns it to the body. But when it gets up to number three, the oxygen-rich blood returns to the body, skipping the heart-lung machine. So that's kind of the route on how it bypasses um, the chambers and the lungs during the procedure. During bypass surgery, the um, blood is being circulated and oxygenated outside of the body, and the heart is stopped. You see this during a cabbage procedure. Now, one of the, or some, I should say, there are many disadvantages for having bypass surgery. First of all, it's a very long operative surgery. Um, second, it requires anticoagulation therapy, which could be something like Coumadin, which would be a lifelong treatment. The patient can experience hypotension. They're also at risk for having a stroke during the bypass surgery, as well as some dysrhythmias can occur. 
complications can be pulmonary. You can have electrolyte disturbances because remember that heart's being oxygenated and circulated outside of the body. You can also have neurological deficits, which would be your stroke um, as a result of the surgery. Now what determines if a patient's uh, a candidate for bypass? Well, the client has multiple coronary artery occlusions with 50% or more blockage of the vessel. They have two vessel disease with angina and three vessel disease without angina, so that can make them a candidate. Um, they can have persistent ischemia or MI even after um, angiography, PCI, or stent placements. They can have some um, heart failure or cardiogenic shock following an MI as well. They may have some orthomas or calcified or non-compressible arteries and that's because the stent's not able to hold the arteries open. They can have coronary uh, disease that's non-responsive to medical treatment. And this can be some anatomical locations that can prevent um, just a normal catheter to get into the, proceed, the location. Um, so if the catheter cannot enter the occluded vessel, depending on the location, you have to go in and bypass that occluded area. So for bypassing, understand that you are bypassing the area that's occluded or um, rerouting uh, the flow of blood around that occluded area. So in order to do that, they have to graft a vessel. The saphenous vein, which is located in the lower part of the leg, in the calf area of the leg, that's the most popular vein um, that's used for graphing for a bypass procedure. Now there's some alternative um, vessels that can be used if the saphenous vein is not uh, viable. And you can use the internal uh, mammary, the internal thoracic, um, basilic, uh, cephalic, radio, um, radial, I'm sorry, radial artery, um, and the gastro um, artery in the stomach as well. That can be used. So there are some alternatives to the saphenous vein if the saphenous vein is not viable. Now during the procedure they attach the harve harvested saphenous vein to the aorta or below uh, the occlusion wherever that occurs and you can have a double bypass, triple bypass, or a quadruple bypass surgery. Um, in this PowerPoint there's a link to a video for um, heart bypass surgery also known as a cabbage so you can watch that video it's pretty cool. Now there are a couple of different ways they go about bypass surgery. You have off-pump coronary artery bypass or you have what's called a minimally invasive direct coronary artery bypass. So there's a, here's a couple of alternatives to the traditional uh, cabbage procedure. So a port access coronary artery bypass is just another alternative to a traditional bypass surgery. Um, the selection or the type of bypass surgery the client has is just going to be up to the physician and the criteria that the client meets as well as the facility and what's available. So all, the, all patients are treated individually and um, as to what type of procedure they need when it comes to bypass surgery.
So we've already discussed the PCIs or the PCTAs, and we've already discussed um, bypass surgeries. So now we're going to look at valve repairs and valve replacement. So a commissurinotomy is the opening of adhesions in the valve, um, the valve cusp. You could have a balloon valvoplasty. Um, a valve repair or replacement can be done during a cardiopulmonary bypass. You can also have a valvoplasty um, can be done as well. Here I have a link to a video for a balloon valvoplasty that's done inside of um, a cath lab setting. It's a really good video, so take a few minutes and watch that. So you have mechanical valves and bioprosthetic valves. Some of the disadvantages or risk factors for the valves are um, development of thrombi or emboli. So the client's going to need uh, lifelong anticoagulation therapy um, when they have their valve replaced. So you can have ventricular aneurysms and heart tumors. So with a ventricular aneurysm, that's caused by an MI lots of times, know that that is an emergency and you have to get in there and repair that weakened structure as soon as possible. With a heart tumor, the tumor can be benign or malignant. If it's a benign tumor, um, care is relatively uncomplicated. However, if it is a malignant tumor, the uh, prognosis for that client is very poor. So heart trauma consists of non-penetrating injury or a penetrating injury. So with your non-penetrating injury, that could be a crushing injury for instance, like a car accident, and that can cause bruising and bleeding at the heart. Um, it is treated with bed rest, uh, pericardiocentesis, or even an open thoracotomy. Now, if it is left untreated, it can lead to cardiac tamponade. A penetrating injury is like a stab wound. Treatment for that, of course, is going to be surgery. And it has to be done immediately because the patient is going to be suffering from shock and hemorrhage. So this is your patient criteria for a heart transplant. Cardiomyopathy, end-stage coronary artery disease, end-stage heart failure, or congenital cardiac defects. This is the criteria for a heart transplant. With heart transplants you can have problems and complications. You have what's called rejection which can be hyperacute, acute, or chronic. With an acute rejection this occurs one to three months after the transplant. Almost all transplant recipients can experience some type of acute uh, rejection to some degree. In order to alleviate that rejection, they have to take um, certain medications, those um, anti-rejection medications, they have to take those the rest of their life. Now they can also develop an infection Lots of times the infections are caused by bacterial, viral, or fungal, and um, the symptoms are very similar to rejection. However, infectious processes are very life-threatened, threatening, and they must be treated with the antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungals. There is a high cost associated with um, your heart transplants. 
Also, the rate of survival is 85 to 90 percent one year after surgery, and 10 years after surgery, the survival rate drops to like 56 percent. There's also scarce um, organs out there. Um, very few hearts are being donated for transplant. We have peripheral bypass grafts and vascular grafts. Um, with the peripheral grafts, the indicators for that is acute circulatory compromise in a limb, a severe pain at rest that interferes with the ability to work. With your uh, vascular grafts, the bypass or replace um, the disease section is a major uh, systemic blood vessel. It's pretty large and that has to be replaced. Complications um, can be graft occlusion and compartment syndrome as well as an infection that can occur with either peripheral or vascular grafts. Other vascular procedures consist of an embolectomy, thrombectomy, or an endarterectomy. An embolectomy and a thrombectomy remove a thrombus or an embolus that's occluding a major vessel. An endarterectomy is a procedure where a resection and removal of the lining of an artery. And this removes arthrosclerotic plaque from the aorta, carotid, femoral, or popliteal arteries. Here I have a video on this PowerPoint of what's called an ECOS, which is a thrombolytic um, procedure where it works to dissolve clot using ultrasonic waves. So now let's talk a little bit about the nursing management for the client undergoing a cardiovascular procedure, whether it be bypass surgery or PCI or even um, endarterectomy. So oftentimes these clients are anxious or nervous before they go into their procedure. So they may be prescribed um, some anti-anxiety medications for that, such as maybe a little bit of um, Xanax or Ativan prior to their procedure. In doing this, the client um, who's relaxed and sedated, they require less anesthesia once they get to their procedure. Now, whenever a client comes back after their procedure, it's very important that you palpate those pulses. You need to palpate that to see um, if you can feel them. However, whenever you're doing your, um, your pulse checks, if you cannot feel or palpate that pulse, you need to get what's called a Doppler. Now, a Doppler is a, a device you're going to place over where you suspect that artery is at and you're going to uh, listen for that pulse. Um, if you can't find a pulse with that Doppler, uh, then that's when you need to let the charge nurse know or let the physician know that you can't find that pulse during your pulse check. Also know that whenever the patient has undergone that cardiac or vascular surgery, you need to assess the client's fluid intake and urine output every hour. The vital signs, on the other hand, you're going to check those vital signs every 5 to 15 minutes. Um, but you're going to check that urine output every hour <clears throat> uh, to make sure that they don't have any kidney injury, any renal injury. And you're going to check, like I said, those vital signs every 5 to 15 minutes postoperatively. When a client comes back, especially if they've had um, a cabbage procedure and they've had their chest opened up, it's going to be really hard, to, hard for them to take a deep breath and to cough. So that's when you need to make sure that you give them a pillow that they can press against their chest so they can cough, take that deep breath. That will help um, give them comfort and alleviate some of that pain and it will also decrease the potential for dehissing that surgical incision open.
depending on what type of cardiothoracic surgery they've had. The client may have to avoid lifting or pushing or pulling anything that weighs more than 10 pounds um, until the physician um, tells them otherwise. And it can take 6 to 12 weeks for that incision to heal or before the doctor releases them and says that they can now lift. But they need to avoid um, lifting, pushing, pulling, anything that weighs more than 10 pounds um, for at least 6 to 12 weeks or until the physician releases them. Also, we need to encourage that client um, before they leave the hospital that let them know that it may take a few weeks or days before they have a normal appetite. Um, they also need to know, especially your bypass clients, those bypass, those patients who have a cabbage, it's, it's normal for them to be uh, depressed. Uh, so you need to tell them that that depression is normal. And we as nurses need to understand that that's, that's temporary, that bypass surgery is a life-changing event for many people. Uh, they view it uh, differently. Um, and like I said, it's very life-changing. They feel that their life has to be is now altered because they've had that bypass. So depression is normal. Uh, lack of appetite is also normal. And it's just going to take a few weeks for that to come around. Um, do let them know, however, that whenever they turn to their physician's visit, their follow-up, checkup, that if they are still having a lack of appetite and or any type of depression, they need to discuss that with the physician. This is the nursing plan of care for cardiac or vascular surgery, both before and after. Knowledge deficit, anxiety, and risk for impaired gas exchange. Always know you are one of a kind and you have something great to offer.